You are listening to the Tuesday Eastern Conference Edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan from Locked On Senators alongside David Morasuti from Locked On Leafs. We are one week away from the first Eastern Conference matchup of the NHL's regular season. And we had big news out of Long Island. The New York Islanders have locked up forward Matthew Barzell to a monster contract. We'll get into all the details of that. Check in on some training camps and big storylines heading into the final week of preseason. This is the Locked On NHL Podcast. It's your team every day. Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On NHL your first listen on this Tuesday, October 4th. We are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way you can help the show grow is to like every video by clicking the thumbs up and subscribing to the Locked On Senators channel. Our question of the day, which we'd love for you to answer in the comments, is what are your thoughts on Matthew Barzell's extension with the Islanders? The extension carries eight years in length. It starts in 2023 and it's for $9.15 million per season. David, what were your thoughts when you saw that come across Twitter? I was like, wow, Lou emptied out the bank for this guy. Like That that was the surprising part, because we know that it's been a back-and-forth affair between Lou and Barzell with past contracts, right? They did the three-year. He's coming off the last year of his three-year deal that didn't... It took some time to get that, that signed, and you know, everything kind of structured the way they wanted it to. But the first thing I looked at was, did he give any signing bonuses? Because Lou Lamarillo does not like giving bonuses. And lo and behold, this contract is purely salary based. Yes. And it doesn't ascend or descend. It's just flat, easy, all the way through 9.15 per season. Now we know Matthew Barzell is an electric talent. Hell, he just earned the richest contract in Islanders history, a total of $73.2 million. So that's on one hand. And on the other hand, this is a guy who, despite this electric skill, is still looking to replicate the production from his rookie season back in 2017-18. How do you think this contract's going to age? I... I think for him is going to age very well because he's going to be paid very handsomely. But if you're the New York Islanders, is this a guy that you view as a nine on this team? Yeah. He's kind of viewed as the $9 million player because there's really nobody else at his talent level. And I think that's the problem is because his talent level is just so far and above everybody else on the team. It inflates his value that much more. But if you put him on a lot of these other top notch teams, I don't think he's earning that. At least he's not earning that much because I don't think what he's been able to do throughout his career in New York really has a value at that. But maybe that's part of the problem. Yeah, maybe it is. And maybe it's also a part where, yeah, Barry Trotz is an unbelievable coach, but he's not necessarily a guy that you're going to put up huge offensive numbers. He's not the most creative offensive guy. He's more of a let's win 2-1, let's win 3-2, let's play these low-scoring tight checking games and as a number one center mind you a number one center who hasn't had the most talent to play with on Long Island no disrespect to guys like Anders Lee and Brock Nelson who have put up some decent seasons points wise but he hasn't had like you know Mika's got Panarin in the other uh, in Manhattan right like you've got these players who are helping their centermen produce the amount of points that they are whereas I think Barzal is still looking for that in, in a in a partner and not there's nobody there new that that hasn't been already is the Islanders had a pretty uh, quiet off season, except for moving the 13th overall pick and getting Alexander Romanov, a defensive defenseman. So again, probably not the guy that's going to help Barzal explode offensively. But the thing is when you watch him play, you can see the talent is there, right? You can see all the moves he makes. You could argue some of his best hockey could have been in that bubble playoff run when he had 17 points in 22 games, helped the Islanders get all the way to game seven against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And that's just a coin flip against what ended up being a back-to-back champion. So 
I see the potential. I think he could probably cap out at 90 points and you'd have to take a step forward for that. But if he can get to a 90 point potential, just over a point per game player, I think when you're paying that much money, that's what you'd like. And there's also not many comparables, eh, David? Like the, the closest is probably Braden Point. And even that is is kind of apples to oranges. I think this quote from Lou Varmerill really speaks a lot to, I think, what the issue a lot of people have this, with this deal. Matt has the ability to raise his game and to be a special player. And now with this contract and our faith in him, that puts that responsibility on him. And to wow. me, it's just like, so he has the ability to raise his game, but he hasn't done it yet. And you're paying him to hopefully get there. And whenever teams do that, they say, okay, we're, we know what he can do and what he can become. But why are you paying him before he actually gets to that point? Right. I love the pressure to perform and to perform at that contract that puts a, that puts pressure that he doesn't really he shouldn't really have because he already has pressure to take you know to carry this team in a lot of ways. It actually reminds me of the Jeff Skinner contract after he had that big year, and he had to and he has not lived up to that contract ever since signing it. Like, it's, it's teams just get get themselves caught into these situations where they say we know he, we think he can get there. It's like well, you kind of have to know he's already there before you give him all that money. You think, especially under the circumstances where it doesn't kick in right away, he's still in the final year of that bridge you mentioned. Yeah, like he's making seven million dollars. It's not a massive increase; it's only just over two million bucks. But you know, at seven million dollars, he's kind of maxed out in terms of what he's shown already. Like he's really got to pick it up now if he wants to get into that kind of that next tier, right? I always think of the like these contracts and sort of like tiers of where you're paying guys. As soon as you get them over that 8 million, you're talking elite production, like 90 points. If he doesn't even get anywhere close to, you know, the 85 to 90 range, like that's just not going to look good because that's what the expectation is. That's, that's the responsibility they're placing on him to take that next step offensively because you, we've mentioned it the last few years, it's been all about defense and playing responsible hockey, but that's not going to be enough to get this Islanders team to the, to the next level that they want to achieve. This was just a disappointing year all around for the New York Islanders. From a 15-game road trip, was it, to start the year while their new building was being finished? Then, them and the Ottawa Senators both had the first, they were kind of the test tube babies for COVID in the NHL where they just played through it until they really could not go without postponing games. They lost a lot there. And for the first time in a long time, they kind of lost that shine. And then they lost their head coach. Barry Trotz was fired at the end of the year. Lane Lambert, who by all accounts seems to be a bit more offensive minded. So I want to see how he plays in this new system. But if you're Lou Lamorello, could it have gone that much more if he got 80 points this year? Like it would kind of feel like it's still the going rate. So I wonder if it was more from a fan standpoint where they were putting pressure on him because he is kind of the sole like superstar quality player that they have. They have really good players. Like I said, Anders Lee on defense, Pelik and, uh, and Pollock are both like very solid players. And Noah Dobson might enter that territory if he takes another step in the right direction. Another guy who Lou decided to bridge. We'll see how that plays out. But this is the one guy with like star potential. He's the guy who you're going to buy a ticket because Matthew Barzell's in the game and you don't know what he's going to do next. But he does have to take a step in the production for this monster contract. People were saying that Tage Thompson got overpaid and he looks good in preseason, asterisk preseason, but that's making $2 million less per year than Matthew Barzell. And I believe he's a year younger on top of it. So I'm really curious to see how this one ages, not only for Matthew Barzell, but for the Islanders as well. Yeah, I mean, the benefit is that he is 25, right? You know, he's not some guy who's entering, you know, into the plus side of 30, which is the worst time to ever sign a deal like this i've seen a lot of those guys get to get paid basically everyone who left ottawa look at stone's contract carlson's contract and so on and so forth mike hoffman even and you know we hear the with the salary cap projection going up you know star players are looking and saying oh that's a bigger slice of the pie for us to get in terms of our aav so maybe lou larimel is also thinking about matthew barzell if we waited he might have and he has a really good season he's going to want that slice of pie to be a lot bigger so get it Fair. done now 
before and Lou's done this before where he's gotten guys done early and sometimes it works and sometimes it just does not work but it's Lou Lamarillo he does not care what other people have to think about the contracts he signs yeah so Matthew Barzell got paid he signs the richest deal in New York Islanders history a total value of 73.2 million over eight years David I was a little nervous that it was still going to be Rick DiPietro not because the AAV was so high but what was that contract 15 years or something oh it was it was what the longest contract in NHL history, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. The owner wanted to give it to him. And then Gar Snow went from backup goalie to GM. And then he's like, Hey, let's take care of Rick DiPietro. How many years was it? I believe it was 15. Uh, and that, that buyout was like, you know, it was bad in terms of for the Islanders for Rick DiPietro. He was making money well after, well after he was done. Yeah. 15 years. And it was he's still, he's getting paid until 2029. That's like, like just the most ludicrous deal I've ever seen, but <laughs> that that's just what the, what the Islanders were just at that time. He was the guy, right? He was their guy, yeah. the guy they were going to build their franchise around, you know, also when they signed these 15 year deals and I, I always think back, it was, well, it was yeah, 15, 15, yeah. Wow. 15 years, 4.5 million per. So they're probably saying four and a half million dollars for, I don't know, our top caliber starting goaltender is great. But then you're also like, you're signing a goaltender to 15 years. I'm not a fan of giving goaltenders long-term deals. Yeah. And these, this was like the, my, <laughs> always my number one example and that one and Luongo's deal, two yeah. contracts that they never, neither player lived up to. He was bought out July 3rd, 2013. So, you know what? You could argue that he fulfilled a decent part of it played seven years of that deal it just so happened to not even be half as they're on the hook for 1.5 million dollars every july 1st rick di pietro collects 1.5 million dollars until 2029 that's unbelievable a little aside for you there as we like to have some fun here on the locked on nhl channel i want to get in a little bit more to why matthew barzell's contract could look better over the next number of years and we're going to touch on the leafs and the Sens, how are their training camps going? And we'll take a peek at some of the other storylines. I just watched Uri Slavkovsky play tonight, and I know you have too in games against Toronto. We'll tell you what we think. Uri Slavkovsky, the number one overall pick, where we think he should play this upcoming season. But all of it is brought to you by Built Bar. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, and they come in so many amazing flavors, you'll never get tired of same old same old you can grab one to go you can throw it in your lunchbox you can really make it as versatile as possible but what you do know is you're getting a nutritious snack that tastes great these built bars are packed with protein but they don't have much calories i believe it was 130 calories the one i had today and it's called cookies and cream i felt like i gained 150 calories just saying the words cookies and cream but no not with built bar only 130 calories but they pack in 20 grams of protein and for all those saying whoa 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 the sugar's got to be wild four grams you kidding me go check them out yourself at built.com and use our promo code locked on 15 promo code locked on 15 gets you you guessed it 15 percent off your next order at built.com go try the puffs as well go look them up protein infused marshmallows need i say more 100 covered in chocolate and it's all at bet at (laughs) It's all at built.com. Promo code locked on 15. Promo code locked on 15 at built.com. All right, you're listening to Eastern Conference Tuesday on the Locked On NHL podcast with David Morasuti of Locked On Leafs. I'm Ross Levitan. You can find me over at Locked On Senators. I just want to pick up on that Matthew Barzell conversation a little bit more. The salary cap. It's been stuck at $81.5 million for far too long. Where do you think that number can realistically get to over the next five years, David? Because we're seeing jersey ads. We're seeing helmet ads in the seven-figure category. And revenue seems to be bouncing back from COVID a lot faster than maybe projections had. I mean, if it doesn't get over the $90 million range... And, and, you know, the broadcast deal was the big one for me with ESPN and TNT. That was a huge, 
thing for the NHL to get more out of the U.S. market deal. But if it doesn't get over $90 million, in my opinion, that's that's a bit of a failure from the NHL's level, considering they didn't. I know that they didn't make a lot of money during the COVID pandemic, but they didn't lose a whole lot either. But they were also having to pay players full salaries when they weren't getting full revenue. I totally get that. But at this point, and you, you brought up the, the ads on jerseys, the ads on the helmets that help bring in some of that lost revenue. You're seeing the vert. I don't know if you noticed the virtual uh, board ads now, like they change during the game, not distracting at all. Um, that's that's another thing the NHL is doing. You know, the ads on the on the glass. You've I've seen them in some games. It looks tacky, but it's what brings in money for the NHL. They're trying all these little things. And they're gonna they're gonna add up to increased revenue. You know, Seattle, you know their expansion deal that that paid a big one too. Of course, there are, could be better ones if you you know move a team like Arizona to a market that actually fills an arena and doesn't need a college arena. But yeah, I think it has to get to ninety million at some point over the next what three four years. So that basically gives you one more star player. Or two good NHLers, or just raises what the big dogs are making realistically, which is why, as a Sens guy, I'm pretty happy to see them locking up these long term contracts before. And yeah, there's risk, they have to live up to any sort of increase in salary. But you got to think if it goes up 90, those eight million dollar deals like Barzell 9.15, that'll feel more like eight and a half, eight. And at that point, you're like, oh, yeah, well, he can definitely fulfill that type of percentage-wise for the cap. So I think I'm super curious. And we need another trend-setting contract because we knew Nathan McKinnon just signed the the richest contract. And what what did he do? Like 0.1 in AAV? Like he barely inched over what McDavid signed for three years ago. And I know you probably don't want to hear this, but Austin Matthews is the guy who should cash in next not after this year but next yeah he and he definitely will whether it's i mean people will say oh well if the leafs don't somebody else will definitely give it to him i mean the Leafs will give it to him the Leafs have yes. never tried to shortchange your, their stars um the the big one yeah i think it's that the richer get richer and the poor unfortunately stay <laughs> where they pretty much are right it, it's you know where I always see teams get in trouble with the cap, salary cap is like the middle end contracts, those four, five, six million dollar deals that just they become boat anchors at times. So uh, Austin Matthews will definitely set the new standard. I remember what do you about, think, thirteen, or do you I think, think he goes think even more? It would be in the thirteen million dollar range when he was trying when they were trying to sign him to the long term deal and they tried to get the eight year term. Freeman had reported that. He wanted a higher AAV if they wanted the full eight years, which is why they only did the five year term. Makes sense, because though. Austin Matthews and his, you know, his representatives knew that. Well, they didn't know at the time a pandemic was going to happen, but they <laughs> knew that eventually the cap's going to go up, which means the teams are going to have a lot more money to spend. And what these guys bring, and people say, "Oh, but they're not. You know, how can they be worth that much?" Look at how much, you know these guys bring to their le- to their teams. Oh, you tell me Austin Matthews is not worth to the Leafs $13 million a year. Easily. He is. I think he's probably, I think the team would Chuck maybe even more. And just for reference sake, if, if people aren't, uh, aren't totally familiar, uh, Connor McDavid at 12.5 was the highest. And then Nathan McKinnon just signed for 12.6. Yeah. And like, it's, it's good that you get these kind of baselines, Austin Matthews is going to say, well, I'm better than Nathan McKinnon. How much better I am. And Connor McDavid, I think, I don't know how many more years he has left exactly on his deal. That's going to be the one everyone's going to be watching after the after Matthews is done because these guys always try to one-up each other, right? And also some of these star players, I mean, McDavid did the eight years because he really, he was kind of following what a lot of the star players were doing now. McKinnon did the eight years. I'm curious to see if Matthews will follow the eight years that all these other guys did because he didn't out of his out of his ELC. Very interesting. Connor McDavid, by the way, four years left, including this one on the monster one hundred million dollar deal on the dot that he signed for over eight years. The cap hit percentage was sixteen point six seven on that one, and 
to put that in perspective, that was actually a higher percentage of the cap than Nathan McKinnon's was. And Nathan McKinnon has more value. So it just shows how stagnant the cap has been over the last number of years. But we hope that that goes up very soon. We're also excited that there is NHL regular season hockey this week. The Nashville Predators and San Jose Sharks will play overseas in Prague. David, did you catch the scene in Bern, Switzerland at Roman Yossi's home stadium after? You got to go check that out on the Pred social media. Super cool arena. Everyone's cheering for them. It must be the coolest feeling for those guys getting to bring their NHL team in and show off to their home fans. Yeah, these guys love going back home. I I, I know Switzerland is just a beautiful place to be. So I don't think NHL players are, are you know, these guys would – uh, complain too much about playing in these beautiful cities, you know, especially even if it's just for a few games because they get to visit and see the si- scenes. But European fans are a totally other animal too. I don't know if you've ever mm-hmm. watched the game out in Europe. I've watched fair, you know, fair share of tournaments on TV, and the, these guys just bring a different energy. It's incredible. So it, it doesn't surprise me that a guy like Roman Yossi, who you know, kind of puts Swiss, you know, Sw- Switzerland on the map. Uh, no, in terms of his the, as a hockey nation, we've seen a lot of NHL players, you know, go go there after their careers, or you know, when they're trying to during lockouts, a lot of them go to Switzerland. Austin Matthews went there for his rookie year. Yeah, he said, "Screw the U.S. national development team. I want to make some money. <laughs> yeah, I live in Switzerland for the year. Play Smart under Mark Crawford. Yeah, right. And so th- it's a very it's it's a great thing initiative to do because it just it makes the NHL more globally recognized. It, it, there is the NHL does have a global brand. Some say that they don't. They, there's a potential there to expand more. These are the kind of the litmus tests to see. All right, at what level can we actually expect this to be a success for us and something that we can continue to do? Yes, very interesting. I'm extremely interested in learning how many more games we'll see. Is it just going to be a couple this year? We have the two games to start the year between Nashville and San Jose. And then in November, Columbus is going to go to Finland. And I'm just trying to remind myself who they're playing. Colorado, thank you. And that's cool because they've got two Finnish stars there, Miko Ranton and on one side, Patrick Laine on the other. And it's a brand new stadium in Tampere in Finland. So it's going to be super cool to see that and obviously Ottawa mentioned they went there in 2018 and Eric Carlson got to go to his home uh, stadium in Frölunda and in Gothenburg. So super cool. All, all these players getting to bring their NHL teams over to Europe. All right. When we come back, we're going to wrap up today's show with a couple storylines that we've noticed through the preseason in the Northeast, almost said division, the Atlantic division, but the Northeast teams, obviously with David Morasuti here from locked on Leafs, we'll touch on that. And I'll tell you what's cooking in the nation's capital up here in Canada. And both of us has played against Montreal and all eyes have been on your eye Slavkovsky, the first overall pick in this past draft. You know that Matt Sundin is the last forward who was drafted first overall to not play in the NHL the next year. That was back in 1989. So it's been a long time since this has potentially happened. I'll get David's take on if that's the right move for Uri Slavkovsky. There's also one of the last picks of the first round who thinks he's sticking in another Canadian market. So we'll get into all that coming up right after the break. You're listening to the Locked On NHL Podcast Tuesday Eastern Conference Edition. All right, you're listening to the Locked On NHL Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan from Locked On Senators alongside David Morissuti from Locked On Leafs. We've got Western Conference Wednesday coming up tomorrow, but I can't not mention Brad Lambert. This kid just looks unreal. And some people had him as high at five on their draft boards. He might be the Winnipeg Jets' best player through this preseason. I'm curious if he earns a spot on the opening night roster. Yeah, there's the this draft, uh, I thought it was a very good draft into the talent, and you're starting to see it. And in Winnipeg, like they're a team that's, you know, they're they're kind of on the bubble in terms of are they a good team or are they a bad team? But they got some good young players like Cole Perfetti. You had Brad Lambert into that. I, I was a big Brad Lambert fan going into the draft. I was very curious to see where he was la- going to land. I thought Winnipeg, Winnipeg did a fantastic job because they need that in, you know, infusion of youth in their forward ranks. And he's kind of the kind of a perfect fit for them. I think so, too. It's going to be a lot of fun. And obviously, Winnipeg's success 
hinges heavily on Connor Hellebuck in goal. We know that Montreal goaltending, it's just not going to be it. And you expect a bit of a letdown. Not every team can go from Henrik Lundqvist to Igor Shosturkin, David. Not every team can. And in Montreal, they're rebuilding. They get that first overall pick. I think your Slavkovsky should be playing with the Laval Rocket. I just watched him last night play against Ottawa. He was given a great opportunity. He was playing with Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield. Both of those guys were able to produce. And Slavkovsky got absolutely rocked by Artem Zub. He's 240 pounds, but I think he really needs some time with the Montreal Canadiens development staff to learn how to play on the North American ice. Because so many times they brought up on the broadcast, Mike Johnson was doing the color. He's obviously fantastic about the X's and O's. And he was talking about every time where you're coming in and you should be taking a center lane drive, he would, and I'm assuming this is from playing in Finland on the wider ice, he would always try to like go wide and then drift into the middle. So I think he needs to learn a little more straight lines. Still a ton of talent. I'm not saying he's a bust at all. I think he's going to be a great player, but they got to be patient with this guy. He's not a finished product right now. You wouldn't expect finished, but you know what I mean? Like he's not an NHL player right now. No, you know what? Like if they want to do one uh, one thing I, I thought maybe they could try to do is you can give them the opening night if you feel like you want to get sure. him. Not to totally take you know tank his confidence and say we're going to send you right down to the hl i think you give him that opening night game you give him a couple of games the montreal canadians are not expecting to do much this season this is a pretty a big development year for this team for their young players and yeah i do think that he should be playing majority of the year in the ahl because he the worst thing you can do is if he's struggling is to be in front of those reporters every night or the coaching staff being asked every night if he's not playing well. Now, if he's in Laval, there will definitely be media covering him there. They're not just going to let him be. <laughs> uh, that's the thing with having your AHL team so close to your NHL team. But at least the expectation when you're in the AHL is different than you're, when you're in the, in the NHL, right? At the NHL level, you're expected to produce and you know pr- produce at an NHL level, at least in the AHL. You can work on things. You can kind of, the coaches staff can say we're trying him out on different things because we want to work on his development. It's a different sort of expectation when you're looking at where these guys play. I'll bring up kind of another example when the Leafs had William Nylander. Some people thought, you know what, he doesn't look too bad. He could probably play in the NHL. The Leafs were like, no, we're gonna actually send him to Sweden keep him as far away from the NHL as possible and make him kind of earn his way there. Then eventually he was brought to the Marlies. People like with the, when he was with the Marlies, like, ah, oh, this guy could play in the NHL right now. Nope. We're going to keep him in the AHL. You have to do what's best for the player over the long run, not just what you're seeing now. And we know that Ken Hughes has been very, he's been pumping the brakes on this kid. He doesn't want his confidence to get too high or get too low. Keep the expectations manageable, especially first overall pick in Montreal. Last thing you want to do is let this become a media circus with your, you know, a guy that considering everything that's happened since the day he, he was drafted, you want to make sure you manage the situation as best as you can. And have a plan. And I'm sure they do, but it's it's if the media in Montreal senses that the plan is isn't set in stone. Then they'll smell blood and be like, so what's the plan with the soft cost? Why is he here? Why is he there? He could go overseas. I think the best play is just down in Laval, learn from the coaching staff, play on the small ice. But he, he's a unit out there. Even though like he was bad tonight, I would say, in terms of like creating offense and that, he's still a presence when he's out on the ice. You can still tell that there's this big guy who can skate rather well for his size out there. And I think he's going to be a hell of a player. But if you're a Montreal Canadiens fan... I think you should probably be smashing the patience button with him and sending him to Laval. They've got nine free games to work with, though. We saw that with Miko Rantanen a number of years ago. Played nine games in the NHL, went down, and tore it up in San Antonio. But we'll see about that. Uh, What's the big storyline right now out of Maple Leafs camp? I know Rasmus Sandin just got signed. And then what are they doing on the back end? Are there still a bunch of injuries? I know Muzzin was out for a little while. Ah. There's, There's a lot of, you know moving parts going around they don't really we we kind of know how certain players which players might play together but the injuries kind of throw a lot of wrench into everything Tavares's injury also changes how they want to do things up front but the big one is the Leafs are over the cap they got to get under the cap and they don't really have a lot of wiggle room you know 
they're going to probably send a few players down, but they got to figure out a way to get right under the cap. It's going to be a tight squeeze. Um, our boy Mike uh, actually brought the idea of trading Pierre Angle on that. <laughs> that that did not go well with some of our, our viewers, but it's the reality of the situation. And personally, I see there have been some good, it's a lot of players stepping up in this preseason, especially younger players, Nick Robertson being one of them. Uh, you know, Pontus Holmberg has looked pretty decent. In order to create opportunity for these guys in the lineup, Somebody has to go. That's that's we talked a lot about the salary cap. Unfortunately, it squeezes a lot of the of what you can expect out of a roster. So yeah, the blue line is something we're keeping an eye on just because of the injuries. But there's a lot of movement that's going to be coming between now and opening night. Yes, there certainly is. And for all that, you can go follow David and Mike over at Locked On Leafs, over at Locked On Senators. It's much of the same. Just getting the chemistry going with a lot of new faces Alex DeBrinket starting to contribute he had a goal and an assist against Montreal the other night both were either from or to Claude Giroux so great to see those guys going and if you haven't done your fantasy pool especially if you have a deep keeper league grab Shane Pinto while you still can this guy's got seven points in three preseason games and he looks real good you got him on your squad yeah, I got him I got him deep in the reserves yeah I, I knew, you know, this, we actually have to pick rookies and like minor. And so he was like one of my top targets. He is an absolute stud in the making. We'll see what kind of opportunity he gets. But right now the Sens have split up the talent on their power play. So their second unit is Tyler Mott in front of the net. Okay. Feels like a second unit. Yeah. To bring it on one side, Giroux on the other Pinto in the middle and Jake Sanderson, fifth overall pick at the top of the, umbrella so that's a little hint for all you poolies out there and for more on your pools go check out locked on fantasy hockey podcast with steel roden and flip livingstone we had those two fellows on our show this week so if you want to go check that out you're welcome to do so on youtube or wherever you get your podcasts any final thoughts today david next time we talk it's going to be opening night in the eastern conference of the nhl or should i say the north american opener after the two games in Europe this weekend. And it's an Eastern conference rematch between the New York Rangers and Tampa Bay lightning. Can't wait. Just um, preseason. It's good for the players. Good for the teams. Not good for the fans. We want to see meaningful games. So I'm looking forward to that. Hey, we appreciate you joining us here today. David we will always have a great time. We'll do it again soon. We're going to do a crossover between Locked On Leafs and Locked On Senders later this week. So stay tuned for that. We'll talk next Tuesday and we'll pass the baton over to Jess and Brett for Wednesday Western Conference. For David Moore, Sudi of Locked On Leafs, I'm Ross Levitan. You can follow the show on Twitter at Send Central and make sure you're subscribed to Locked On NHL.